to the Shah Seminar Series. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited for the speaker today, so I'm not surprised that the room is absolutely jam-packed. So I'm sorry if you're all a little bit squished at the back. But there, are, there is some room. Yeah, there's some room at the front. If anyone is eager. No? Okay, well, today we have Professor Kate Pickett, who's Professor of Epidemiology at the University of York, and she'll be talking about her work on inequality. Thanks. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here at Shah. Um, but this is the first time I've given a seminar at Shah, so that's nice. I thought I'd start with um, these quotes just for you to sort of have a look at what world leaders are saying about inequality. Um, and they mention it quite a lot these days. So we have Barack Obama talking about inequality as the defining challenge of our time. The Pope calls it the root of social ills. Even the director of the International Monetary Fund has said that they've downplayed inequality for too long. Now we understand that a more equal distribution of income allows for more economic stability, more sustained economic growth, and healthier societies and Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, um, also talking about how social and economic inequalities tear the social fabric and undermine um, social cohesion. And that's great, because a few years ago nobody was talking about inequality at all. There has been a real shift um, in world leaders and other people's willingness to discuss it. It's back on the political agenda. Um, it's still getting worse everywhere, but this is the first step, and a, first, a necessary first step towards there being change. Um, it's not just world leaders, um, NGOs, charities, other actors in the international arena are also taking inequality seriously. Oxfam um, now prioritises inequality in its campaigning, and every year it makes a calculation like this. This one is um, a couple of years old. Um, 85 <coughs> richest people own the same wealth as the 3.5 billion poorest people in the world. That number is now 63 this year. It does tempt one to put them all in a single boat <laughs> and do something with it. Um, but it's quite a shocking statistic, um, that level of global inequality. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today are the human costs of inequality. Um, and I'm going to take you through the research that I've done with Richard Wilkinson, and which was summarized in our book, The Spirit Level, um, but then move beyond that to describe research that's happened since then and what our current thinking is about the human costs of inequality. And we often start by putting this picture up. Um, as a way of describing what, what motivated <coughs> our research and our focus on inequality. Um, this is a photo of people taken outside Oxford Street tube station one morning. And they look really miserable. Okay? There is not a smile among them. Um, some of them look upset. Some of them look quite angry. Some are talking on their mobile phones. None of them are talking to each other. Probably all of these people are employed because it's rush hour and they're going to work, but they look absolutely fed up. <laughs> and if you'd asked any of our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, what do you think life would be like at our current levels of affluence, they would probably have expected us all to be really happy. We are well fed. Many of us are too well fed. We are well clothed for the most part. We have labor saving devices and cars, etc. We live in a world of relative material affluence, most of us, but we're really unhappy. And so it's trying to understand that paradox, really why, in the midst of material affluence, are we so socially and psychologically? miserable. And what we find out is that it's all caused by income inequality, so now you can all go home. <laughs> um, it, it really, it's not 
only income inequality, but it really is that simple. We find that income inequality <coughs> is a root cause of a whole raft of health and social problems. So I'll take you through some of that evidence. And the starting point is this chart, and I know that to those of you at the back of the room, this is just going to look like a, a cloud of smoke, but those are all the names of different countries. And what we're looking at is life expectancy up the side here, so from 40 at the bottom to 80 at the top, against a measure of national income per person. So the average income in those countries plotted against the average life expectancy. So you can see that in the early stages of economic development, as countries get a little bit richer, life expectancy increases a lot. So in poor countries, economic gains, economic growth, improving material living standards is really important for public health. The population's health improves massively. But once you get beyond a certain point, it just levels off. And countries get richer and richer and richer, moving along towards the right. Um, but there's no extra benefit of life expectancy. So population health doesn't improve above a certain level of economic development and standards of living. And yet within every single one of those countries, we know that income is related to health. Something's missing. Let's see. Here we go. Um, you all know this. Um, again, these days are slightly old, but the pattern is the same. Here again, we're looking at life expectancy in years. So we're going from 70 at the bottom, because we're in a developed, rich society now, up to 80. And these are electoral wards in England and Wales, ranked by their deprivation score. So these are the most affluent, the wealthiest areas, and over here are the most deprived areas. And when these data were collected um, in the most deprived areas, life expectancy was about 71 and a half, and in the most affluent it was just over 79. It's gone up since, but the gap remains. In fact, <coughs> the gap is increasing, and that was in the news, what, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and you see even bigger gaps across particular cities, you know, rich and poor areas of London, rich and poor areas <coughs> of Glasgow, etc. So there is an effect of income <coughs> within a country, but it's not just that the poor do worse than the rest of us. We have the social gradient that I, I'm guessing everybody here in this room is very familiar with the notion of the gradient and the fact that we need explanations of health inequalities that explain why this group, the second most affluent, do worse than the richest, as well as why the poor <coughs> is badly relative to the top. So income means something within countries, but appears not to mean anything between them. This, these are the rich countries, it's just really that top um, right-hand part of the chart I showed you before, life expectancy 75 to 80, against national income per person, and no relationship at all. So, as well as health, we were interested in other problems that have that social gradient. Things like teenage pregnancy, levels of imprisonment, kids dropping out of high school. Um, the only reason that these are American publications is because they have coloured um, news publications with photographs. We just have newspapers. Um, so, all of the, all the kinds of problems that have those social gradients, we were sort of theorizing, might be affected by the level of inequality within a society. So we created an index of those health and social problems, um, and it includes measures of health, life expectancy, infant mortality, um, obesity, and mental illness, which includes drug and alcohol addictions in these measures. Um, and also measures of social cohesion. So we've got trust and imprisonment, um, but also things to do with how children's life trajectories play out. So we've got social mobility, um, how kids do in school, and um, teenage birth rates. So all of these things in an index all have those social gradients that I talked about. And again, plotting them against national income per person there's no relationship between them. 
Um, so you can have a rich country like the USA with a much higher level of health and social problems than a similarly rich country like Norway. Just no relationship between the two. But if instead of plotting this index against national income per person, average income, we plot it against a measure of inequality, this is the picture we see. So the more equal societies, Japan, Sweden, Norway, Finland, you know, the, the um, Scandinavian countries, much more equal, much lower level of health and social problems, and the more unequal countries, the UK, Portugal, and the USA, doing much worse. And it's such a close correlation that if you know a country's level of income inequality, you can do a pretty good job of predicting its performance on all of these indicators. The measure of inequality that I was using in that chart is simply the ratio of the incomes of the top 20% to the bottom 20%. Um, how much richer are the richest fifth compared to the poorest fifth? Um, and economists have developed all kinds of measures for measuring income inequality. Gini coefficient, um, which has nothing to do with Gini jumping out of bottles. The Robin Hood index, which does have to do with how much you would have to take from the rich to give to the poor to even things out. Um, but this one, it's quite easy to understand, it's quite intuitive. So if we look at Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the top fifth have incomes that are three and a half to four times those of the bottom fifth. And in the more unequal rich developed countries, it's more like seven to nine. We don't have Singapore on this chart, um, but they're at nine. And we sometimes have data for them. So you can see that there are countries sort of all along that scale, and because of that variation, we are able to, to study the effects of inequality. We knew that people might think that all the patterns we're looking at are to do with cultural differences between these countries. Okay? So one thing people often go is like, oh, it's just the Scandinavian countries. You know, they're different. They're a bit odd. <laughs> they're not like us, right? Us, we're a bit different. You know, the English-speaking countries, it's all driven by us. It's not, because you can actually remove the English-speaking countries and the Scandinavian countries and Japan from that index chart in relation to inequality, and it's still a statistically significant relationship. But nevertheless, we thought we'd do it all again in a separate test bed to see if the same pattern held, so we did it for the 50 US states. Created the same index of health and social problems, plotting it here against state level income inequality, down at this end, we've got more equal states. There's Utah, Wisconsin, Iowa, New Hampshire, Vermont. More equal, doing better on the index of health and social problems. And the more unequal ones up there, we've got Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, New York, California, tending to do worse. Not as close a correlation. Obviously, other things are affecting these health and social problems. But again, it's a significant one. And then, because we thought some people might think we'd just chosen the problems we looked at to suit ourselves, we did it all again with somebody else's index. Um, and we used the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing, which was published in 2007, and looked at that in relation to inequality um, and found the same thing. Um, more equal countries, Sweden, Finland, and Norway, Netherlands up there, having a higher level of child wellbeing than the more unequal societies. And some of you may remember this index being published because we came bottom. Do you remember? It caused quite a, quite a fuss because we did worse than the United States for once. Um, among rich countries, our children had the lowest <coughs> levels of well-being. And what we did particularly badly on was, oh, guess, what did we do badly on? Any guesses? Education. Mm. We weren't great on education, but we weren't bottom. Well, finding your peers kind and helpful was really a problem for our kids. Having sex before the age of 15 and binge drinking. So we did really pretty poorly on the psychosocial aspects of well-being. But this index has got 40 components. It's got everything in it, like whether or not kids can talk to their parents, 
whether they eat five fruits and vegetables a day, have had their immunizations, etc. So this again was confirmation that the pattern we're seeing is sort of real and we didn't just make it up. Um, and recently, UNICEF published in 2013 a new index of child well-being from the same countries. And so we were able to look at change. They unhelpfully didn't use all the same indicators, so a fair amount of manipulation was required to just get the core set. But there were 20-something indicators that were present in, <coughs> in both years. So what we're looking at here is the change in the UNICEF index of child well-being, and countries that have improved are at the top, um, countries that have where the well-being has declined are at the bottom, and we've related to that to change in inequality over time. So countries that are becoming more equal are over here on the left, and countries that are becoming um, less equal over here on the right. Um, and we've been particularly interested in Sweden, <coughs> which is has the fastest growing inequality among the OECD countries and has seen a decline in its child well-being that would absolutely predict from that increased inequality. So countries can change and it does have an impact. So I'll just take you through a few of those um, individual components of our index. I really am doing this just to give you a sense of the scale of the differences. So this one is trust. What we're looking at here outside is the percentage of people in the population who think that most others can be trusted, which is considered a pretty good indicator of social capital, generalized trust, you know, trust in people you don't know. Um, and in the more equal countries, about two thirds of the population feel that they can trust others, and it declines to less than a fifth in the most unequal. And we think this is a really important indicator of social cohesion because it affects all of our interactions with each other in all kinds of settings. So imagine being a woman walking home alone at night in a country where everybody trusts one another compared to one where they don't. Or being a young man and seeing a group of other young men on a street corner. Or think of what relationships are like in the workplace, on the school playground on public transport, etc. So it's a very pervasive um, kind of measure. And in the US states, we see exactly the same pattern with about two thirds of the population trusting others in the more equal states um, and less than a third in the most unequal. So a very similar scale of differences. Here's mental illness. Now, what we're looking at here is the percentage of the population with any mental illness in the past year. And this is done from diagnostic interviews. It's, so it's not asking people, have you seen a doctor? Has a doctor told you you're depressed? Have you been treated for mental illness? Because that would be affected by access to health care and cultural differences. So instead, these interviews ask about symptoms. Are you having trouble sleeping, et cetera, et cetera? and your answers are then clustered into different categories of mental illness, and here we've got the percentage of any. So it's the adult population, and in the more equal countries, um, about one in 10 adults have had a mental illness in the past year, and for us in the UK, it's 23%. 26%, so more than one in four in the USA. Um, and we must think of this as a tip of an iceberg of distress, actually. Um, so really quite shocking prevalence of mental illness. Here are homicide rates, the murder rate for US states, <coughs> the red dots, and Canadian provinces in blue. This is homicides per million people per year. Um, data come from colleagues in Canada. <coughs> and in the most equal of these Canadian provinces, there are about 15 murders per million people per year, and it's 150 in the most unequal US states. So it's a tenfold increase in the murder rate, strongly correlated with income inequality. And here are imprisonment rates. So this is on a log scale, and I know not everybody here will be a quant type, and some of you may have forgotten your school maths. 
Um, it simply means that the distance on this scale between 10 and 100 is the same as between 100 and 1,000. Okay? And we had to do that, because otherwise you can't fit the USA. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it would be up on the ceiling. So, in the most equal countries, about 50 people in prison per 100,000 population. Um, and it's 685, I think, in the USA. So, what's that? About a 16-fold difference, I think. And this is so closely correlated with income inequality that if you know a country level of inequality, you can predict how many people are in prison, apart from Greece. <laughs> Which we sometimes joke is because they're, they're not very good at keeping people in prison. Like <laughs> so just after, just after we had produced this, two of them escaped. And um, it was in our newspapers because of the way they did it. A helicopter flew into the prison yard, landed, they got in and flew off, <laughs> which is, is dramatic in itself. But the thing was, it was the second time those two had done it, right? Using the exact same method. Um, inequality in um, prisoners isn't particularly related to inequality in crime. That's a really important feature of this. So US criminologists suggest that about 30% of changes in state level imprisonment in the US are due to differences in crime rates. It's really to do with how harsh the judicial system is. Okay? So it's to do with whether or not you get sent to prison for a particular crime, how long you get put away for, and what the recidivism rate is like. And that, of course, has a lot to do with how you're treated in prison, whether you're given educational opportunities, vocational training, whatever, um, support for mental illness and addictions. So this actually sort of masks um, or, or expresses the ways in which people who don't conform in society are treated by others. We've also done an analysis looking at um, the age at which children are considered responsible for their crimes, and that is related to inequality as well. So the more unequal the society, the younger the age at which children are considered to be um, responsible for crimes. And in the UK, our imprisonment rates have been skyrocketing while our crime rates have been declining. We send people to prison every day in the UK for shoplifting, um, mostly women. In the USA, since they introduced the three strikes and you're out law, you can get a life sentence for a minor drug offence if it's the third time you've committed it. So there are people in prison for life without possibility of parole for owning, you know, a gram of cannabis. <coughs> and we feel that that um, imprisonment day to sort of reflect fear in society. It's a fear of deviance. Um, it's being frightened of other people. So when inequality increases and trust declines and the social distances between us increase, we're more frightened of one another. We're more protective of our property. Um, and we've noticed when we've been visiting very unequal countries how that's expressed just on every residential street. This is Mexico City, just an ordinary house, um, spikes on the gates, lots of barbed wire. This is, oh, no way. This is um, South Africa. Um, here we've got an electric fence on the top of the gate. It says armed response, if you try to get in, someone will come and shoot you, and if they don't get you, the dogs will two big dogs there. Every house on that street was like that. Um, and this is Chile. Um, again, this is an electric fence protecting somebody's property. So you see this again and again in the very, very unequal countries of the world. And of course, gated communities are another response to inequality. Increasing wish for people to segregate themselves from the problems of society. And the last one of these index figures, this is social mobility. It's the well, social mobility is measured as the correlation between a father's income when his son is born and that son's income 30 years later. 
So it's asking the question, do rich dads have rich sons, poor dads have poor sons, or can you um, move away from your sort of family of origins class? Can you be socially mobile? It's men and boys because Back when they started collecting the data to do this, there weren't enough women in the workforce. So it's just, just men. <coughs> um, the more equal countries have high levels of social mobility, the more unequal ones much lower. The UK has had stagnant social mobility for 30, 40 years. Um, and the land of opportunity is right down here at the bottom. So if you want to live the American dream, you go to Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> to get to Denmark. <laughs> And this, this is actually very, very hard for Americans to accept. It completely contradicts their notion of themselves as a nation. Um, and most Americans have no idea that that is the case. You know, they do truly believe in, in the possibilities of their country. So that's all about the scale of the impact of inequality. Um, I also want to make the point now that we're all affected by it, that it isn't just the poor. <coughs> and this is quite difficult to do. What you need to be able to do to demonstrate this is you need to be able to compare people in more and less equal societies at different levels of social economic position. And that's quite hard because even if you equivalize incomes, they don't really mean the same across different cultures. Education might not mean the same social class. But, you know, we do what we can. These data come from Canadian Doug Wilms, and he's looked at the literacy scores, so the educational attainment of young adults, in Sweden, very equal, Canada, kind of middling for the rich countries, and the United <coughs> States, the most unequal. Um, and the children's scores, the young adult scores, are ranked by the amount of education their parents have had. So down here are um, the scores for people whose parents don't have much education, and it makes a huge difference to be in Sweden compared to the very unequal United States. But even among the most educated parents, there's still an advantage to being in a more equal society. And this fanning out pattern seems to be quite um, consistent for different kinds of outcomes um, and different kinds of places where you see the most impact at the bottom, but you see a persistent um, effect all the way to the top. So we've seen it um, for health measures as well. And I had a PhD student who's just finished and is, is now getting ready to publish, who's been looking at five-year-old children in birth cohorts in six different countries. And she's been looking at things you can measure at the age of five that are really good predictors of health and social well-being throughout life. So she's looked at height, cognitive development, and social and emotional development. And again, we see this fanning out pattern, this social gradient in every country, but it's <coughs> steeper and it's further down, you know, it's not as good in the more unequal countries. So inequality has this wide range of effects. They're large, and they seem to affect us all. We have colleagues at Harvard who call income inequality <coughs> a social pollutant because it's pervasive and affects everybody in society. So we had all of these data. You will all have noticed that they are simple correlations, ecological level. Um, and to be able to interpret them, we were really sort of drawing on experimental evidence from other disciplines, particularly from psychology. Are there psychologists in the room? Yeah. You do some pretty nasty things to people, <laughs> and we're going to see some of those now. So one of the things that, um, that psychologists have been very interested in, <coughs> in their discipline, is what kinds of things are most stressful to human beings. And so over the years, they've done countless experiments where they bring people into the lab. Usually it's students who want a few pounds, right? A bit of beer money to do something nasty. 
Um, they bring them into the lab, they give them unpleasant tasks to do, and they measure their stress response, their hormonal stress response. And Dickerson and Kameny, who are psychologists in California, did a meta-analysis of all of these studies. And I think they found 272. Um, and so they were trying to find out what kind of tasks most reliably raise cortisol levels. And what they found was that it was tasks with what they call social evaluative threat that really stress people out and other tasks don't. So if I asked all of you right now to do a maths test, some of you might find that a bit stressful. Most of you probably wouldn't because you look like a clever bunch. But if I then asked you all to read out your marks, then your stress hormones come up, okay? So it's, it's situations where other people have the opportunity to judge you negatively. That is what is most stressful to us. So if we tested all of our stress hormones right now, mine would be high, and yours would probably all be okay. Because right? I'm the only one facing the wrong way. <laughs> so this consistent finding of social evaluative threat affecting our physiology. But it also affects our brains and our cognitive performance, our, our functioning. And this experiment comes from researchers at the World Bank, and it's done with Indian school <coughs> boys. And what they did was they brought the boys into a lab setting, and they gave them puzzles to solve. They were those maze puzzles where they had to find their way from the outside into the middle. How many could they do in a given time? And they did it under two conditions. They did it when the boys didn't know each other's cast, and the high cast boys in the kind of light blue performed about the same as the low cast boys in the sort of burgundy color. But after they'd gone around and announced to one another which cast they were from, the performance of the low cast boys plummeted. Because they know how they're seen by other people. And psychologists call this stereotype threat. If you belong to a group about which other people have, hold negative stereotypes, then that affects your performance. In America, this has been shown with black and white school and college students. If you give them tests and just say, here's a test, they do equally well. If you say it's an intelligence test, the performance of the African American kids declines because they know <coughs> what stereotypes are held about them. And ladies, if we are given maths and spatial tests, we do just as well as the guys, unless somebody tells us that science has shown that men are better at that. And then we don't do so well. And in fact, we're so sensitive that all we have to do is tick a box at the top of the test that says male, female, and our performance declines. So, how other people judge us affects our physiology and it affects our cognition. It also affects our emotions. Um, and the study here is one with monkeys rather than humans, because not even psychologists would do this to humans. <laughs> well, they might do some of it, they can do all of it. So in this study, monkeys were kept in individual cages <coughs> for a while, and their brains were scanned and we're looking for happy chemicals here, they're looking for dopamine, basically. Um, and then they were moved into groups and housed together and given time to form um, a rank, a hierarchy. So some monkeys become top monkey, which is really nice, yeah? You get groomed and you get more food and you get more sex and everything. It's really good to be top monkey. And some monkeys became bottom monkey. Less food, less grooming, no sex. Now, these are the monkeys that are going to become dominant when they are housed on their own. And oh, they're already, compared to the ones who are going to become subordinate, have slightly different brain chemistry. They're a bit happier. When they're socially housed and they become top monkey, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree, because it's really nice to be top monkey. Whereas the subordinate monkeys don't benefit at all from group living. So you could do all of that with students, actually, if you had enough houses. But you couldn't do the next bit, because then they taught them to self-administer cocaine. 
okay? So they taught all the monkeys how to take cocaine, and the dominant monkeys didn't bother. They didn't need it. But the subordinate monkeys took a lot. And then their brains looked like these brains. They medicated against their social pain. Now I know those are monkeys, and not humans. Um, <coughs> but recent studies, neurobiological studies, are showing that our brains um, feel social pain just like physical pain. The same areas of the brain are affected by social pain as by physical pain. And this is done in experiments where um, you artificially exclude, make people feel excluded. Like so you have a ball game, you're all passing the ball, and you're all secretly have decided not to pass it you know, to you. And so we, we all pass it around and you wait, we never pass it to you. And then your brain feels the pain, just like if we'd stamped on your toe. Um, and other studies showing that if you give people paracetamol over a period of time, their social anxiety and pain declines. So our brains and our bodies are very connected. So we now think, that, that's sort of really where all the evidence was about five, six years ago. Um, there's been a lot more since, and what we now think is that there are probably three different ways in which people can really respond to inequality, to living in a more hierarchical, status-ridden, um, socially distant society. And one way is to sort of withdraw and go under. And that's why we see a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety in more unequal societies. And Paul Gilbert at the University of Derby has done a lot of research on depression. And he and a number of others think that depression is sort of a hangover of our evolutionary past. It, it's a withdrawal response that's very much related to how animals sort of back down from a confrontation. Um, flat affect, withdrawing, sleeping a lot, um, and, and that maybe that is why we have so much depression, because in the past it was perhaps a protective thing, it stopped us getting into fights that we couldn't win. But that's certainly um, one way in which inequality might affect all these health and social problems, higher prevalence of depression and anxiety. Um, and we've also now seen studies even linking income inequality to the incidence of schizophrenia. But then the other way in which you might respond to a more hierarchical society is to try really hard to kind of claw up and hang on and scrabble your way to the top. And our first hints that something <coughs> like this might be going on came from um, work of Danny Dawling and Anna Barford who were looking at um, self-rated health in relation to an objective measure of health in different countries. So here we've got a list of countries, the percentage of the population who say their health is good, and then life expectancy. So at the top of the chart, we've got Japan, longest life expectancy in the world, it was 82 when these data were published, but only 54% of them say their health is good. Whereas in America, where people only live to 77 years on average, 80% of them are doing really well, or say they are. So we started, in fact, these, these, um, <coughs> these are almost statistically significantly you know, negatively correlated. And in more unequal countries, it looked as if a bit of a tendency maybe for people to sort of describe their health as better, even though population health is not good. So we were sort of theorizing that maybe in a more unequal society, it's more important to present yourself as doing okay, to um, save face. And there were hints of that as well from the self-esteem research in the USA, where the group with the highest recorded self-esteem is African-American men, who probably suffer the most discrimination and prejudice. So hints that um, this self-enhancement might be going on. And then, someone actually did a study of that. 
They looked at self-enhancement in relation to inequality and found that self-enhancement was higher in the more unequal countries. So self-enhancement is thinking you're better than average, really. That's how they did it. So they asked people, do you think you're a better driver than average? Are you better looking? Are you more intelligent? Are you a nicer person? All of these questions to get a sense um, of self-enhancement. So in America, 96% um, of people think they're better drivers than average. <laughs> and in Sweden, it's only 66% which is still too many, because right? um, we can't all be above average, despite what Michael Gove used to tell us about our schools. Um, but people self-enhance more in the more unequal societies. And once researchers had figured out that their measures of self-esteem probably aren't measuring what we think of as self-esteem, they've done a better job of splitting out a sort of realistic assessment of your own capabilities, which is what we think of as sort of self-esteem, feeling proud of those, versus a narcissistic <coughs> one. Um, and now that we have measures of narcissism over time in the USA, we can see it rising rapidly, just as inequality <coughs> has been going up. You can't use the Rosenberg scale of self-esteem with American school and college students anymore because they all max out, okay? But narcissism is probably picking up that trend. Um, and I would really recommend Jean Twenge's book, The Narcissism Epidemic, because it's full of fascinating stuff. So we had thought that status anxiety and worrying about your status was probably the explanation of all of the health and social problems we were seeing, and now somebody has demonstrated that as well. So these are data for European countries. The top line um, is the most unequal countries. The bottom line is the most equal countries. We're looking at reported status anxiety, um, and we're looking at it by income group. So here are the poorer people, and over on the right, the richer people. And you can see that at every level of society, people are more anxious about status in the high inequality countries. I think I'm going to skip Paul Piff and his demonstrations of how badly the rich behave. I'll just say that they do behave not even touching it. Is it okay now? I don't know. They do behave really badly. They um, cut other people off at intersections. They don't stop to let old ladies cross the road. They're willing to take candy from children. They're narcissistic. They're not very nice and they're not willing to help others. But we'll, we'll skip that. But if you make them think about egalitarian things, they behave a bit better. Um, so recently, we've published a causal review on the literature on income inequality and health, looking at it through an epidemiological causal framework, and we are convinced that this is a causal relationship for all the reasons that I've explained to you. Um, and we're delighted that reducing inequalities is now one of the sustainable development goals, which is remarkable. 193 countries have signed up to these, which are supposed to be achieved by 2030, and reducing inequalities within and between countries is goal number 10. It wouldn't have been if our own Prime Minister had his way. He fought that on the high-level panel advising the UN. Um, along with Save the Children, I wrote to all of the panel members asking them to make reducing inequality a priority. And they all wrote back and said, yes, what a good idea, apart from David Cameron, who said, no, we won't. Not a good idea. We've also been doing a lot of thinking about the connections between inequality and sustainability, which I don't have time to talk about today. But there are important implications for the transition to a sustainable economy um, from excess levels of inequality mainly due to how it drives consumerism and consumption. 
Um, and that's all written up in a Fabian Society pamphlet, which you can download free from their website. And even more excitingly, someone's made a film inspired by a book. And The Divide is in cinemas right now. It's on limited release at the moment. It goes on general release on May 31st. Uh, it's made by an independent filmmaker. <coughs> um, we talked to her, but you know, it's, it's her film. She made it. It's her, her story. Um, I actually think it's really good. I cry every time I watch it. It's very moving. So I hope you get a chance to see it. Um, and we've also set up the Equality Trust, which is um, a charity that tries to both educate about inequality and campaign for a more equal society. The website is www.equalitytrust.org, and there are a lot of resources there, including sets of slides and things like that. So if you want to know more about inequality, do go there. And on an international front, um, we're founding members of the Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity. So um, that website is www.asap4all.org, and that sort of is, is more focused on um, the well-being economy, sustainability, transition to a new economic paradigm. And I showed you that photo at the beginning where everyone looked really miserable. This is what we would like society to look like. Every day, a happy picnic, people sharing food and smiling. Um, so that's the goal, and I will leave that one up there to take questions. I'm a bit nervous of that. <laughs> do, you not want, do you not need it? I th no, I think, I think I'll manage without it for the question. Okay. So thank you.